our friend Marco Vignuzzi for um, this uh, QBI seminar. Uh, Marco flew from Paris to San Francisco to now sit in a room that's just a few feet away from me to give this seminar. Um, although obviously he's been here for several days. It's great to have him here and he's meeting with friends and, um, and, and, and collaborators. Uh, so as many of you know, Marco has been uh, um, working with scientists here at UCSF and at QBI over the last two years on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. And a lot of the great work that we've been involved in here just could not have been done without Marco um, and his team, uh, including Veronica and, and Bjorn. So it's been so great to work with Marco. Thank you so much, Marco, for your collaborative effort over the last couple of years. And it's great to have you here finally in person um, as well. So um, a little bit of background on Marco. He um, born in Italy, but raised in Canada, um, in uh, Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. And I, probably most people haven't been there, but it is a quintessential blue collar town, a mining town. And if you meet somebody from Sudbury, they almost all have character and an amazing work ethic. And these are definitely things that um, Marco has. Um, so from Sudbury, he went to McGill for his undergraduate degree, and then uh, his PhD at the Pasteur Institute uh, in Paris, and then um, came back here to, well, to North America, to UCSF, where he did a postdoc in the Andino lab, and then moved back to Paris, um, where he's been a professor for um, the last 13 years. He's got a big announcement at the end of his seminar related to his next move. So I encourage everybody to wait around and, and um, listen to that. Um, and um, Marco has done such great work on RNA viruses, on a number of different RNA uh, viral families, the coronaviruses, alpha viruses, arboviruses, and more recently, obviously, coronaviruses. It's done such great work on getting at kind of the molecular underpinnings, understanding the molecular underpinnings um, in the context of infection across many of these um, uh, different uh, pathogens. And he's going to give us kind of a, I guess, a look back. It's almost like a retirement talk, Mark, Marco, the way you've got this set up. But, but you know, it's looking at the last 20 years, but I actually see this as kind of maybe a mid-career point. It's a look back at the last 20 years um, and I think we're going to see the best yet to come over the next 20 years. So I think you're laying the foundation today for the next 20 years. So um, with that, um, we have 100 participants here, I see. Uh, I'll hand it over uh, to you. Thank you, Nevin. Let me get this started. Up. And there. All right. So it is, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I wish I were in front of the actual faces. I can't see you in the, in the audience, um, but it's, um, this is a, a special kind of talk. As Nevin mentioned, I'm, it's given me the opportunity to look back at everything that I've done scientifically. Um, and so that's where this title comes from, ultimately out of the box. And I'm, I'm trying to describe how I approached my scientific career uh, but ultimately, it made me realize that what it actually is, is a tribute to the PhD students and postdocs, as well as the permanent staff that I've had in my lab over the years, and how their ideas have oftentimes changed the course of my research. Um, and and it's, it's, it's kind of the approach that I've taken in science is to really look for talent and then ask that talent to show me where to go, right? Um, so I will just give a very cursory overview of the things we've done. I'm not going to dive deep into the science. I'd, I'd rather just give stories about the people that did the science, as well as maybe run through the things that were going on in my mind and in my career at that time. And it's, it's a little bit to show uh, the young scientists that are just beginning their careers, the, the kind of things that you go through over time as you reach my stage, which is sort of this mid-career becoming a senior scientist. So first of all, just for those that don't know what my lab does, overall, we study RNA viruses. And over the years, we've accumulated um, kind of the, the model organisms and the model viruses with which we study. But I always try to keep everything under the umbrella of virus evolution and anti antiviral approaches that use evolution um, as, as the mechanism by which we, we develop these antiviral approaches. 
So we look at viruses like complex dynamic populations, so that it's not just one single virus, but it's it's a whole bunch of variants or a cloud of mutants or a spectrum of mutations or, or variants. And we try to, to study what happens as one variant emerges to replace another. Um, my, I myself am a molecular, molecular virologist. That's where all of my uh, st my formal studies have been, but we have these heavy evolutionary tendencies, even though per se, I've never studied uh, evolution. And our work usually goes from uh, one observation, often a genetic observation that I try to characterize as far as I can to the end. So going through understanding the mechanisms and cell culture, and then finally trying to go into some kind of in vivo model to, to determine the relevance of what we've seen initially. And that's the way we've always tried to, to publish our papers. Oftentimes that just ends up in being too much of a story. Um, and I'm certainly, uh, can be accused of trying to say too much in one place, probably what's gonna happen during this talk as well. Um, and then, you know, over the time, we, over the years, we've, we've accumulated expertise in a variety of viruses. So originally from my PhD work and my postdoc work in Raul Andino's lab, it was the picornaviruses. I was studying polio, and then I ventured a little into all of the other picornas. These are really, really small RNA viruses. They're fantastic because they replicate super fast, super well. And when you work in a lab, you have your virus maximum titer in less than two days. And that ends up making me a very lazy virologist. It was hard for me to then move away from picornas. The first move was towards the toga viruses, which are also super fast replicators. And it really is, you know, a very user-friendly virus in the lab. This includes viruses like chikungunya virus, for instance. And then eventually we moved into other things, but the flavies, where I learned that viruses take a longer time to grow. And um, from then we, we, we did some studies in orthomyxoviruses like flu. And then finally, of course, coronaviruses. Like most of virology, we had to, to, to pivot and start working on that. My lab also over the years has uh, a variety of, of facilities. We run BSL3s. We work a lot in the animal facility as well as in an insectary. We have a lot of sequencing. And for the last few years, the WHO Collaborative Center, which studies uh, enteroviruses and enterovirus vaccines, was part of my group. So again, as I mentioned, we look at viruses as dynamic populations. This has been kind of the simplified slide that I've shown even since I was a postdoc. I mean, it just oversimplifies how we can imagine a viral population. And if you look at this flat, um, this flat map as sequence space and imagine that a single genome, a single viral genome is replicating, even after a single cycle, if your genome is eight nucleotides long, you have each mutation already represented, right? These viruses mutate so quickly that they generate about one mutation per um, genome per round of replication. And those can go on to a second round or a third round or a fourth round and quickly accumulate mutation upon mutation. And that's where you get this kind of cloud of variants. And this cloud is not in equilibrium. A lot of these mutations are lethal to the virus and they will disappear. They will be removed from the population. But occasionally some of these variants might have a major or might provide a major advantage to the virus in a changing environment. And that gets selected over time and will replace the viral population. And that kind of selection um, and the events that lead to it is the kind of thing that we try to study on the short term, right? To understand the virus evolution on the short term in, in the lab. Now, I'll go back to where my career started. And in 1997, I started my master's and PhD at the Pasteur Institute, and it was on a really margin, you know, marginal, <laughs> obscure idea, which was on RNA vaccines. Literally nobody cared back at this time. Um, in the late 90s, most vac new vaccinology approaches were looking at DNA vaccines. And ultimately it was shown that a plasmid, if you inject into a mouse, can generate an immune response against whatever encoded antigen, which obviously went through an mRNA step. And so it was in 1994 
94, 95, I believe, where the first mRNA was injected into a mouse and shown to be able to express a protein uh, to which you build an antibody response. So around that time in my lab or in my, in my PhD lab, um, my supervisors thought, well, you know, RNA viruses themselves are RNA genomes that act as messengers. So can we use them to encode for a foreign antigen and ultimately inject this RNA as naked RNA? And it would, it would encompass like a better version of a messenger RNA uh, vaccine because these RNAs will self-replicate. They will make ex uh, an excess number of copies once inside the host. And that was what I did with my PhD. I thought it was pretty cool at the time, but almost nobody else did or agreed with us, right? It was, a, it was a cute alternative approach to plasmid DNA immunization. But again, RNA viruses were really, or RNA molecules were really unstable. There was no way to ensure that they would last around long enough to make a good antibody response. So it was almost impossible to get this uh, even, even um, published in that time. So, you know, fast forward over 25 years, and there you go. Suddenly, the thing that I thought I really believed in at the time, nobody else very much cared for, has come back to be something of relevance, right? So it's just a message for all of you PhD students that are sometimes as dedicated as you are to your project, and you're thinking, well, but will this ever amount to something? You just never know. And you might have to wait a good long time. Unfortunately, I don't own any patents to any of this kind of thing, right? So I'm not rich. But after that period, I shifted over to uh, Raul and Dino's lab. And there we were, um, I was continuing actually this idea of trying to develop RNA vaccines for a first number of years. Uh, poor Raul had to face uh, um, ultimately failure upon failure of my project for the first two years that I was a postdoc. And I have to really thank him for keeping me around long enough to at least launch the project that ended up making my entire career. So in, in about two years, three years into it, I think when Raul started um, be getting desperate and wondering how he was going to get me out of his lab, he told me, you know what, as a side project, just grab onto this thing. They were looking at ribavirin as an RNA mutagen. And he suggested that um, I use poliovirus to identify possible resistance variants to ribavirin and then just describe it. And as he, I remember him saying, we were on a, on a drive somewhere and he said, you know, it'll be a quick, relatively quick paper, a short note that you can publish in three months. And I think dot, 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 and then you can get out of here. <laughs> he didn't actually say that, but I was thinking maybe that's what he was thinking. Anyway, uh, we, we launched onto that. And indeed, we ended up with this, um, with this ribavirin to pull out a ribavirin resistant variant of poliovirus. And of course, RNA uh, ribavirin being an RNA mutagen, it's a base analog that gets incorrectly incorporated into the genome of the virus as the virus replicates. So the resistant variant ended up being a poliovirus with a higher fidelity polymerase. It made less mistakes and it did not misincorporate ribavirin. Now that, which could have been a short note paper, ended up being this amazing tool with which to study the relevance of mutation rate as well as the ability to make mutations to a viral population. Because now we had a virus which, unlike the wild type, um, the wild type virus, poliovirus, which has a lot of mutations and is able to successfully um, infect the, the animal, we had a high fidelity version which seemed to have uh, a compromised ability to disseminate within the host and get at least into the spinal cord and brain. And we showed that by expanding the, the population of variants within this, this viral population, we were able to uh, recreate or reestablish the full uh, pathology or, or virulence of this virus. And it, it's not clear now exactly why that's the case, because there is a, a it's difficult to separate the um, increased 
um, the increased replication fidelity of a virus with its actual speed and ability to replicate. So I'll touch on that in a little bit longer, but it's what started my whole career in studying how an RNA virus needs a certain amount of uh, mutation in order to uh, complete its cycle and ultimately to infect and adapt to new environments and new hosts. So at the end of this uh, postdoc, I obtained a my my I obtained my lab uh, at Pasteur, and in preparing for that, I I actually have to bring up this person who Pam England, who I think is still at UCSF, and back at the time when I was a postdoc, um, she was my smoking section buddy. Um, and so, of course, in UCSF and the smoking section, it basically has only French people. And among them, there was also Pam Minglin. And so this, just before leaving, she gave me this, these points. Um, I call them the Pam Minglin smoking section secrets on succeeding in science. And it actually, uh, they really stuck with me. I'm not even sure that she recalls saying these things. But she said, as you're starting your career as a PI, you're going to want to, A, find a science buddy that is going through the same thing as you. That'll be extremely helpful because it's a very uh, difficult time when you're going through the, the young PI moments and you're always second guessing yourself. So if you had someone that's at the exact same stage, you can bounce ideas off each other. And for that, I actually did have one of my best friends who obtained the same position at Pasteur, Carla Sale. Then she said also, find people you like to be around. Don't panic hire, right? In the first six months, when you're the only person in the lab, rather than hire the first technician or the first person that comes to the door, you need to hire someone that you are going to be able to see over and over all day and all night long for the next few years. And that I had the chance of meeting Stephanie Bocour, who was my first technician in the lab and is still with me today. And finally, don't be afraid to hire people smarter than you, because as you're a new PI, you're going to be full of imposter syndrome. You're going to be hiring postdocs that are barely younger than you are. And you're going to uh, have to fight that tendency to not want to hire someone that might know more about a topic than you do. So I started my lab, moved to Paris, and the first few years was focused on trying to uh, I study in more detail this whole link between the polymerase fidelity of the viral polymerase and the mutation frequency and the ability of a virus to, to replicate and adapt to new environments. The very first uh, person to join my group is Laura Levy. This is a picture of her. She was coming to me. She's in, she was in the MD-PhD program. She first joined my lab as a master's student and then went off to do her medical degree and then returned later, about 10 years later, to complete her PhD. Now, what we started as soon as she joined the lab, and I have to say again, this was it's hard to get to, to get people to join your lab when you're in UPI because no one's heard of you and they're not sure of whether you will be successful or not. So it is a bit of a gamble and Laura took this gamble. She, I think she said that the advantage was that she would have a PI that has dedicated time that's in the lab and at the bench right next to her. But whether it would work or not was, was a gamble on her part. And I thank her for that. Now, the idea was we had a high fidelity variant for poliovirus. It was the only one known in all of RNA virology. Um, and there was a question of, is this a unique thing or can we find fidelity variants in other viruses? Because up to then it was believed that RNA viruses had just a very bad error rate, but that it couldn't change either way. You couldn't increase it or decrease it. So we began by the easiest step, right? When you're trying to make your own lab is if we're not working on poliovirus, let's shift to its closest cousin. And for that, we, we chose Coxsackie virus B3, which is another enterovirus that has a really well-established laboratory model, as well as most of its genetics is so similar to polio that it's, it's pretty known and it's well, well characterized. So we did the same thing. We grew this virus in ribavirin and then tried to establish some kind of resistance. And again, we thought, oh, this is perfect. It'll be a quick and easy paper, right? And we ended up pulling out these two variants that, uh, that um, have changes in a single amino acid in residue 372 or 299. 
So I told, again, as Raul told me, there are, you know, it'll be a quick paper. We'll, we'll publish and describe those variants. But ultimately, as I learned, even in my case, there are no quick and easy papers. So coming off of polio, which is a really well-established model, I thought what I used to do in poliovirus anytime I found some kind of variant that of interest was immediately go to PubMed or to Google search and look to see if anybody else had found it with the potential horror of discovering that what, you're dis what you've discovered has already been described somewhere else. And to Laura's horror, even though I told her nobody cares about Coxsackie virus, nobody studies it, she typed in 299 and 372 and discovered that exactly those two variants were already described in another paper on a Miller-Ride by an Australian group. Now, what was curious, of course, is that a Miller-Ride has nothing to do with ribavirin or RNA mutagens. And that led to a whole other study, a deeper study, where Laura was able to show that a Miller-Ride will, which is uh, the, uh, the water pill, which ends up changing or messing up ion channels somehow affects the magnesium and manganese, manganese concentrations, which the polymerase, the viral polymerase uses in order to perform what it does, to, to incorporate, to, to, to replicate the viral RNA. And by changing these, um, these concentrations, it affects the muted, it, it creates kind of a mutagenic activity which is indirect. And that's how we ended up pulling up these high fidelity variants. So fortunately for Laura, even after, despite a whole year of uh, stress, she managed to put out the first paper from our uh, lab um, in 2009 or so. Now with Laura leaving for med school, I, and my lab being so small, I told her that she couldn't leave until she replaced herself. And she ended up finding Nina Knedek, who is, was our first PhD student and is now a lecturer at Columbia University. And she continued to, to study the polymerase of Coxsackie virus. But instead of finding the high fidelity version, she now characterized low fidelity versions. She performed a huge amount of work along with Stephanie Bocour in, in my lab on mutagenizing different residues of the polymerase and then fishing out which of these had altered fidelity. And she found a whole panel of variants that now were making more mistakes than the normal poliovirus. So it's the opposite of the variants that were making less mistakes or higher fidelity. And in that, she was able to show that indeed, just the same as if you increase fidelity, you somehow affect the virus's ability to efficiently infect a host. If you decrease fidelity and have them make more mistakes, then this also has an attenuating result in viruses. And here you can see in the pancreas at day three, there's significantly less viral titer for all of the low fidelity variants compared to wild type up here. So this was all the work in the first three years in my lab, looking at coronaviruses. And I always wanted to branch out a little further, but again, like I, like, like I said, when you have a certain expertise in one single virus, it's a little scary to, to branch out too far when you've never worked on anything else. And that's where wonderful Lark comes into the story. So Lark was the first postdoc from my lab and it really kind of taps into that one advice that Pam gave me, don't be afraid to hire people smarter than you. So Lark was already start, had already started her postdoc in another lab at Pasteur. She had a long track record of working on arboviruses. So these are the viruses that mosquitoes transmit to humans. And she was working on chikungunya virus. I knew nothing about these viruses, but I really always wanted to work on them. And so I decided even being, although being a little afraid of hiring someone that knows so much more than me, I figured why not, let's go. And she came into my lab and brought all of arbovirology, which to this day remains one of the biggest uh, parts of our work in, in the Vignuzzi lab. Lark is now an associate professor at UC Davis, continuing all her work in arboviruses and, and trying to, to understand the evolution and the, the ecology of these viruses. So one interesting thing I can just uh, highlight here is that at the time when she joined the lab, deep sequencing was still relatively new and hardly anybody was using it to characterize 
RNA virus populations. And so Lark's paper was one of the very first in the most uh, basic way possible because we didn't even have the bioinformatics in our lab. She was able to use it to show that um, in in, in the chikungunya virus, she found a high fidelity variant, which also made fewer mistakes than wild type. And I just really appreciated this paper because it was one of the very first ones to use deep sequencing in virology. Now, as Lark uh, moved on and she had described the high fidelity variant in arboviruses, then there was Kate who joined my lab um, as a PhD student in the international program for PhD students at Pasteur. Kate is now finishing her postdoc at Rockefeller University in Charlie Rice's lab. And Kate was one of the first people to, to start uh, exploring the fidelity of, of, um, of the polymerase in the other arboviruses, and including in Simbus virus as well as chikungunya virus. And here, um, I just highlight one of the papers in which she found the low fidelity variant. So sort of completing all of our work and looking at how, both high and low fidelity originally in the picornaviruses and now in the alpha viruses. But she, while she was able to show that there was a, a clear link between low fidelity of um, chikungunya virus variants and attenuation in vivo in mice, it, in mosquitoes, the results were more confusing, and this will come, we'll come back to towards the end of my talk. And finally, I just wanted to highlight, after the first five years or so of work on fidelity variants, um, we ended with uh, maybe a more, the most complete story, which was in looking at the, the tight coupling of replication fidelity and speed of the polymerase processivity, showing that you know the faster that your polymerase goes, the lower the fidelity tends to be, and vice versa. And for this kind of work, I have to highlight this Stephanie, who is not a PhD or a postdoc. She is a permanent staff and was a technician for most of the life of the lab, and then became an engineer. But the reason this is important is because by being permanent and by not having so much of a, a need to publish immediately, it allowed us to do some of this more menial tasks to try to characterize fidelity over uh, many, many years. And finally complete a story that, while I find is really interesting and, and, and relevant, would be hard in the context of a PhD student or a postdoc's work in which they have to get more papers out in a, in a shorter period of time. All right, so after about five years in the lab, I was trying to figure out, well, where do we go from here? And one, one of the things that we wanted to do in our lab was while we were studying experimental evolution in cell culture and in animals, can we somehow make it or see its relevance compared, compared to something that we're seeing in the real world? And this all began to, how do we recreate virus emergence that we see out there in the field, in the lab? And what are the tools we need to develop in order to, to characterize it and be sure that we're working in the relevant models? So the first thing is um, Tony, who joined my group. Um, he was actually coming from virus, the background of virus evolution. And so he was really helpful in helping our lab think about these topics properly and not just from coming from the molecular virology uh, background that I had. Now, one of the works that I'll highlight just briefly here um, was that he wanted to develop tools, both informatic tools as well as the experimental systems to better identify and show how virus populations are dynamic during their um, their evolution in this short term, right? As they're trying to jump from one host to another. And one of these papers, which I think is a really lovely piece of work that he did, was in trying to take Coxsackie virus and shift it from the HeLa cells that it normally grows into a different cell type, which was A549. And there, after many, many cycles of growth, he showed that there was an obvious increase in fitness of the final population, but that could not be attributed to a single a variant. Instead, he showed that it was sort of the, this mix of variants that was present in the population, that when you put them together at these, you know, the relatively important variants at 50, 10, 10, and 30%, he showed when you put those together, then this group of variants is able to reproduce the 100-fold increase in virus fitness. 
compared to any single variant. And that showed a little bit that in some conditions, perhaps the relevance of minority variants might actually be greater than expected where they can dictate the observed phenotype. Now, again, this is a very uh, experimental model. This was high MOI passaging in cell culture, but it shows at least that in principle, there might be places where the group of variants might be interacting and allowing for fitness to the fitness increase to occur. Now, in this work, what was lacking in our lab was the actual ability informatically, computationally to to follow and map out the kind of variants that were emerging. And this is something that um, Tony helped develop with some mathematicians that I'll describe in a little bit. But around the same time that Tony was joining the lab or was in the lab, uh, we have Kenny also here who came um, from, uh, or who, who was studying the arboviruses. So a totally different viral system. Kenny now runs his own lab at NYU and is continuing the work uh, looking at how alpha viruses as well as flavid viruses are, uh, are evolving and adapting to better use their hosts. Um, now, one of the main stories of Kenny that I'd like to highlight is that we were trying to understand what happens in during the evolution of an arbovirus in the mosquito host. This is work that started or was started by Lark Coffee when she was in the group and then handed off to Kemi. So one thing we wanted to look at is in 2005, 2006, there was, um, there was a, an, a large epidemic that went all across uh, Africa and East, uh, the Indian Ocean Islands, all out to Southeast Asia, in which a single point mutation in the envelope protein of chikungunya called A226V, happened a number of times since 2000 in which it allowed this virus, which normally is circulates in Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, it allowed it to jump to a different mosquito species, Aedes albopictus. And in many cases, such as Indian Ocean Islands, this led to a massive uh, outbreak in areas that normally don't have the original Aedes aegypti mosquito. So again, this is only one nucleotide change. And for an RNA virus that we know these viruses make thousands of mutations all the time, you would expect it to be relatively easy to have this mutation emerge in the lab, right? But it wasn't the case. In cell culture, we weren't able to, to get it to come out no matter what. And it wasn't until we started to look a little more targeted, so we would infect mosquitoes and I should mention in mosquitoes, arboviruses, they are healthy carriers of viruses. They can be infected for the entire life of the mosquito, which can live for several months. And that allows a lot of time for a virus to evolve and adapt to its host. So Lark started the work and Kenny then continued in showing that if you do a very targeted sequencing where you look at the virus present in saliva of mosquitoes, then you have a better chance of identifying those viruses which are increasing the uh, infectivity or transmissibility of this virus, right? Because that's ultimately in the saliva, which is the subpopulation, the compartment that of the virus that gets transmitted to the mammalian host. And Kenny developed this, this um, in experimental system where they infect mosquitoes and then he would place individual mosquitoes onto individual mice, allow them to bite and transmit the infection and then have a second batch of mosquitoes on these mice. And in the end, he would, he would sequence the body and the saliva of mosquitoes, as well as the blood of mice to look at whether there was some kind of evolution happening and whether emergence events were happening. And in doing so, they were able to show that indeed this model, uh, this infection model, which in vivo experimental model, allowed us in a short a time of, as 10 days to recreate the emergence event that took at least years, if not decades, to emerge in the field. And then specifically, we showed that the h 6 v mutation could emerge in the saliva of most of the uh, Aedes albopictus mosquitoes and not Aedes aegypti. So really showing that this was the mosquito population that selected for this new variant. And Kenny then repeated the whole thing with the new strains that are circulating since 2005 and identified 
two new mutations that are most likely to emerge. So this was exciting for us because it suggests that even though you can't possibly uh, um, predict what the next viral epidemic will be, starting from a given strain, you can certainly hope to shortlist the most likely to emerge variants. Now variants of concern, of course, I no longer need to explain since we're all familiar with alpha, beta, delta, and omicron. But these kinds of systems might, out of the thousands of mutations possible, help us to really reduce it down to a short list of things to watch for. But how do we do that? If we know that in our experimental systems, we tend to always land on the same mutations coming back out over and over. That suggests that there might be a certain amount of inherent predictability for virus evolution, at least in the short term. But we need better methods to be able to, to characterize that uh, based on the sequencing that we do. So imagine if, in this case of the, what happened in chikungunya, right? We knew that there was a viral strain that was circulating before 2005, 2006, and a single amino acid change allowed it to jump into a new mosquito. So if we think of sequence space more in terms of these fitness landscapes, you can imagine that um, the single nucleotide change, the single amino acid change means that if you have a virus positioned here in sequence space on a fitness peak, then it's just a quick step over to the next fitness peak, which would allow it to then um, move into the albopictus mosquito species. And then can he show that there were two other amino acid changes that would build upon that first one. But in all of our sequencing data, it also suggested or showed that these two new mutations could not be built on the first original strain. It required first a step over to a 2 6 v and then the other second and third um, evolutionary steps could be made. They couldn't jump from here to here, which suggested that between the fitness peak of the original strain and those two new ones, variants downstream, there was a fitness valley, which would result in the death of a variant. Now, if we were able to characterize sequence space and fitness landscape in this manner, it would of course help us uh, predict where things would go because we would know that viruses will tend to avoid or wouldn't be able to cross fitness chasms as we see here because that would represent a dead virus. But how do we do that? How do we characterize fitness or sequence landscapes and uh, sequence space and fitness landscapes? Well, if we imagine sequence space, mathematically speaking, it's infinitely huge. If we're talking about just nucleotide sequence space, then any genome of length n would have four to the n dimensions. It's a it's a hyper um, it's a it's a multidimensional hypercube, which is just vastly huge. But math is always much much bigger than than biology, and so there was a question of is dimensionality of sequence space high or low for these viruses? Well, the short answer is that certainly for a virus that you are growing in cell culture or in a controlled environment and you are watching its evolution in the very short term scale of just a few days or a few weeks, the, the dimensionality, uh, dimensionality is intrinsically low and that allows us to be able to characterize it and visualize it as well. So how do we do, how do we visualize it? My lab spent uh, the last few years in trying to do this. In a sense, imagine if we can do a fitness landscape, what would it, what would it entail? It would entail having on two dimensions or as low dimensions as possible, all the variants possible, right? All the variations of your genome that you can have. And if you could measure for each variation of genome, what the relative fitness is, that is, does this genome replicate better or worse than the average or the wild type, then it would allow you to make a fitness peak or a fitness valley. And in the end, you would hopefully get something like this. So how did we move into trying to characterize and visualize and predict virus evolution? That required almost marrying our lab with an applied mathematics lab from Lund University. This was uh, Professor Magnus Fontes, who was at Lund University and shifted over um, for a sabbatical, a three-year sabbatical at Pasteur Institute and brought along with them several members of his team. So they were physically in the same lab as my lab. And it was really this day-to-day -day interaction between mathematicians and biologists that allowed for what I think some of the coolest stuff that we've done so far in terms of trying to study virus evolution. 
So in order to do that, um, Raz, who is pictured here, worked very closely with Gonzalo that you'll meet later in the talk. And he developed, basically, we changed the nucleotide sequence of a given virus uh, in order to ultimately, uh, or hopefully theoretically, evolve differently once it starts to mutate. We did this basically by introducing silent codon changes, right? So the codon was different, but the amino acid ultimately was the same. And so that if you start changing the nucleotide sequences, they would go down two different paths. And we took these viruses and then we grew them multiple times in cell culture. And in the end, we did whole genome deep sequencing and we measured the relative fitness of each evolved population from passage one, two, three, four, and five for each of these different virus types or gene, gene, genotypes. And then finally, what we had is we had hundreds and hundreds of virus populations where if you did consensus sequences, uh, sequencing, there were no changes. That's to say there was no dramatic ad adaptation of this viral population. What was came out in the end looked like what was in there in the beginning. But if you looked at minority variants, those at tiny, tiny, really low percentages, there were differences. And these differences resemble very much like what you get in clinical isolates, for instance, in, during a flu season or, or even in, in COVID, where ultimately it's the same strain, everybody has Delta, but there's uh, minor blips of variance or variation at the very, very low frequency level. And we wanted to develop a tool that could maybe parse out and, and separate these to try to find relevant uh, genetic signatures. And so he did this by, they created a method, um, basically it's a, it's a multidimensional scaling method that's similar to PCA, but that is better suited for trying to find signals at the, um, the, the low signal to noise ratio. And in doing that, they were able to show here, for instance, that we could find the genetic signature of all of the most, even the most minor antiviral um, treatment that we performed, including, for instance, amylaride, which uh, in our hands, using all of our other sequencing methods, was always undetectable. We couldn't actually show that there was some kind of genetic change occurring. Now, this helped to show that indeed RNA virus populations are of an intrinsically low dimension. And so sequence space is relatively small. And that allowed us then to start to try to build a fitness landscape. Here, for instance, we took two uh, components in that best separate our initial population to passage one, two, three, four, and passage five of virus. So you can actually see in two dimension that there is some kind of movement, logical movement in sequence space. And then by, um, con by, by actually measuring the relative fitness of these populations, you get this three dimensional view, which is a fitness landscape, where in black, you see the normal wild type population in a very happy part of sequence space or, or the fitness landscape. Yellow shows very high fitness. And even as we mutagenize it, it still retains relatively high fitness where there are other populations or other types of genotypes that we've altered because of their nucleotide sequence seem to fare much, much worse once we start to increase their mutation rates. So this is the first uh, empirical fitness landscape that we were able to build in the lab. And it's really the starting point of future work. This is just a snapshot of one virus in one cell type under constant conditions where we're just increasing mutation rate, right? But this is another method. So that, uh, rather than using a linear multidimensional scaling here, it's a nonlinear method by ISOMAP. And it allows, what's nice about this method is that it allows us to more clearly see how each virus that started in the same part of sequence space is moving away from each other in the evolutionary trajectory. And even the, the biological replicates start to bifurcate away from each other. So it's really tiny discrete changes that you would not pick up by normal sequencing methods. And again, to reiterate how important minority variants are in these viruses, if we only look at either the consensus sequence or minority variants above 10%, then our analysis collapses. We no longer see where the virus population started and where it's going to. And so this helps to show that in some cases, the, the presence of minority variants is relevant and might help predict the direction 
in which a virus is evolving much, much before it actually changes the whole population and becomes readily detectable. So we're hopefully eager in the future to start looking at the clinical samples and how relevant, how, how, how can we use these methods to really see what's happening in the real world in terms of virus evolution. Now, uh, as I mentioned, all of this work was done first by the mathematicians, but in conjunction with the wet bench people in my lab. And this is specifically work done by Gonzalo Moratorio, who is now assistant professor at uh, the University of the Republic and as well as Pasteur Institute in Montevideo in Uruguay. So as I mentioned, we had changed how these viruses are evolving. And now I highlight one type of genotype that we changed where it's making more and more lethal stop mutations. But before I say that, I should really give a big shout out to Gonzalo, who's made our entire lab proud. He started his group just as the pandemic was happening. And uh, he is here um, noted with some uh, pretty amazing people as one of the 10 most important science influencers in, influencers in 2020. And of course, he's being accredited at uh, responding um, really in a, in a magnificent way to the arrival of COVID in Uruguay. And he really helped in shaping the response in his country and ultimately uh, saving many lives by, by responding more efficiently than other countries may have, as well as in generating their own home kits or helping to generate their own PCR kits at times where the reagents were hard to find elsewhere. But back to his actual story in my lab. So when he was here, he was looking again, trying to understand, can we rewire a virus and change its evolution, ultimately change the future of a virus and attenuate it in that way? So this method was by taking the leucine and serine codons, which have a lot of redundancy, and basically he created two different categories, right? This category called one to stop, as you see here, for instance, if you mutate a single uh, nucleotide right here in the middle, you end up with a stop mutation. So imagine with RNA viruses, they replicate and they make a lot of mistakes, you have a pretty, you know, a fair chance at one point of making a stop mutation. And for RNA viruses that are simple genomes where usually you have a single open reading frame, if you make a stop mutation, you kill your whole genome, right? And so what he did is that he altered the leucine and serine codons in over a hundred sites across a viral genome. And then he tested to see whether this affected the ability of the virus to infect and cause disease, and ultimately show that this is a new way to attenuate viruses. Imagine what, what this means. The, the bonus or the benefit is that you now have an RNA virus vaccine that still makes leucines and serines. So physically your immune system sees wild type, but as it replicates, it starts to make stop mutations at those silent codon changes. And in result, it's a, like a suicidal um, attenuated virus. As, as it replicates, it starts to make more mistakes and those are caught by the immune system and the immune system catches up. So the same thing was, was continued. Gonzalo did it in Coxsackie virus and then Cyril helped by showing in a totally different unrelated virus, in this case it was influenza, that it also functions. So it was a broad new way of attenuating RNA viruses by changing their future and not their present. Lucia was then a PhD student in my lab from, also from Uruguay, who then continued the work and uh, moved it over to chikungunya virus. So here is an example in, um, in, you know, in bright blue and green, you see wild type chikungunya replicating, whereas the, the rewired viruses, the one to stop mutants, have much less detectable chikungunya using this live uh, luciferase imaging. And they also, the two of them worked on this idea of coupling the first stuff that we did in a lab, if you remember, we worked on uh, polymerase fidelity, coupling that 
to this new method of rewiring the evolution of a virus. And Gonzalo often referred to taking a really fast car down a really bad road. So using the, the polymerase low fidelity variants that make more mistakes and now dumping it into or coupling it into a genome that can't tolerate these mistakes. That was a nice piece of work showing that you can further attenuate viruses. All right. so. Um, I'll try to <laughs> power through this. The next part is to, we, we've focused in my lab, um, always looking at what are the advantageous mutations for a virus, the things that a virus is trying to or would benefit from in, in increasing its fitness. And we've often ignored the mistakes that a virus makes. And this then comes back to our original work looking at mutator viruses. Those are viruses that make more mistakes than normal. And I had mentioned that in the case of arboviruses, the stuff that we saw in mosquito cells wasn't making quite uh, the sense that we thought. We weren't seeing necessarily that a mutator was making more nucleotide substitutions than normal. And it was Enzo, who is now group leader in Institut Curie in Paris, he is the one who started looking at this in a different way and asked, well, what if these mutators are not making more substitutions per se, but are making more defective genomes or just bigger mistakes? And he did this in Synbis virus, identifying or showing that indeed the mutator strains were making more defective viral genomes. What are defective viral genomes? Those are uh, genomes that have either massive deletions, the, it's the polymerase will jump to another part of the genome and remove very uh, important or functional genes. And therefore these genomes on their own cannot replicate. But if they're in the presence of wild types, sometimes they can become interfering particles where they will steal resources from wild type to replicate themselves. This whole, um, again, it was meant to be a small paper, ended up being um, spotted by DARPA, and it led to this huge program in which we studied whether defective viral genomes could indeed be used as therapeutic interfering particles. And for that, we looked at a whole series of viruses. These are the main PIs, as well as supportive PIs that were in this four-year program. And here I'll just describe the overview of what we did. And basically we were asking, can we use combined evolution and computational methods to tell us what are the best defective viral genomes that can interfere with wild type? And can we then test these and use them as a therapy? So we did it by sequencing um, virus that was passaged in vitro or in vivo. And through NGS, we asked, what are all the defective genomes, particularly the deletions that are made? What are these mistakes? And are there some that are made more often or that are carried through the, the, um, the passage series over time to suggest that they might be able to compete with wild type? And in the end, we get a list of 10 or 20 that we can then test in vivo and in vitro. This is where Vero's main story comes, even though Vero did a ton of work during the COVID uh, pandemic um, related to, to coronaviruses. But Vero basically was able, able, in the context of Zika virus, to identify a defective viral genome that had a major deletion in all of its envelope or its structural proteins, uh, but it retained a lot of the non-structural proteins. And she showed that uh, ultimately over time, these can be packaged and you can deliver them to mice. And if mice receive this, de receive this defective viral genome and are then infected with Zika, then there is a considerable significant reduction in titer of Zika virus, not only at the site of infection, but as well as downstream critical organs like the ovaries and brain. So this was the proof of principle that you can use a defective viral genome to interfere with a regular wild type virus infection and in a sense, poison the virus population from within by giving it a genome that will steal the resources of the regular virus. And in, even more interesting was when we looked at uh, mosquitoes and we give mosquitoes the RNA of this defective viral genome. And two days later, we infect with Zika. And then we look at eight or two weeks afterwards, the presence of virus, we're able to show that while the virus is actively replicating, it is significantly less lower titers 
for the mosquitoes that received originally the RNA of the defective viral genome, and there's almost no transmission. So using defective viral genomes, we're almost able to entirely block the ability of the mosquito to transmit Zika virus. And this opens an entire new prospect in uh, vector control. Okay, so finally, there's here is uh, all the stuff that was done in the lab to basically characterize antiviral approaches, always looking at evolution as the, the groundwork and whether we can change uh, a virus's ability to, to mutate or to evolve uh, to its disadvantage. But there has been other work in the lab, and I, again, I can't cover everything, but I do want to at least mention the people. We have Mika Veronica Bernarova, who is now assistant professor at Charles University, Czech Republic, was the mathematician in our lab that helped develop a lot of our bioinformatics and is now doing a lot of modeling to better characterize how a virus is replicating or infecting both in cells as well as in vivo. Brian's story, which I rarely am able to fit into the context of my own work because he really launched his whole niche um, study in my lab. And it was all about looking at uh, various metabolic, metabolic pathways that are involved in virus replication. And he ended up looking at polyamines and polyamine synthesis and its role in RNA viruses. And he was able to show that indeed this is it was known that, that polyamines were involved in DNA viruses, uh, but there was only about two papers published uh, at the time that Brian joined my lab with RNA viruses. One said that it was relevant, one said that it wasn't. And that was about all that was done for the last 20 or so years. And Brian ended up tackling this topic and showing that indeed this is relevant to all the RNA viruses that we had in the lab. Now, one thing, that I thought I'd never have to do was that coming from Brian's work, which showed that polyamines such as um, uh, spermine and spermidine are essential to viral replication for Zika, was suddenly that a doctor in the Philippines took our work and used it to show that ingesting semen would somehow cure COVID. And I actually had to go on record saying, and I never thought I'd have to say, our work has nothing to do with semen nor with COVID. So there you go. Um, finally, there's James wagner Lucarelli, who is now in Virginia Tech. He has come to the lab and he was studying a lot the alpha viruses as well as other arboviruses, uh, but with a keen interest on looking at the differences in host. And some of his work in my lab, which is now what he's carrying on in his own lab, is to look at the, uh, the, the dietary state of the host and how that might infect um, the viral infection and pathology. And then we had COVID hit and that turned our whole lab upside down. I always show this movie because it was until COVID, my favorite movie that I'd watch multiple times a year because it made me feel relevant as a scientist. But since COVID, of course, I can't possibly watch anything like this. But at that time, this is what brought us to UCSF and working together again. And here I'm showing Nevin, showing another Canadian ultimately as, as that we've worked closely with. I can't describe all the work that we've done here, but um, it's ultimately just to show that there was always a UCSF Pasteur story that continues ultimately the USA France love affair. But perhaps we can also wonder whether Canadians are a secret Masonic society because we seem to be running the show quietly underneath it all. Again, you all know about this work and I don't have to go into details with it. Um, and that also led to this important paper, which made slightly more uh, noise in France, because in France, there were large proponents uh, 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 or people that were proposing hydroxychloroquine as a, an antiviral, as we've seen elsewhere. And our paper showed perhaps why in vivo, why it works in vitro in cell culture, but possibly not in vivo. And with that, came the ultimate email that scared the heck out of me, 
Didier Raoul, of course, who was one of the main proponents for hydroxychloroquine, wrote me an email in response to that paper. I have to give him credit. He was very lovely about it and congratulated on the paper. And it led to just a more thorough discussion. But it shows how, uh, how politicized that everything about COVID had become at that point. And even Didier Raoul, who was on the other side of that argument, was facing a lot, a lot of pressure and nastiness from um, both you know, the media and people. So um, I hope I managed to give a quick overview of the most fantastic lab I've ever had and all the members that were a part of it. You've met all of my babies that have moved on to have their own labs. If you like the kind of work we've done, they're gonna be better at doing it. And you may wanna consider joining their labs too. They're found all over the world right now. Also, I have to mention the remaining permanent staff and uh, two PhD students that are still in my team and that uh, will be with me for the next few months. And I also didn't get to touch very much on the last postdocs that have just left the lab and are just still putting out their papers, including Alexandra Hardy, who I don't even have a picture from because of COVID. And that ends my talk. And with that, uh, it ends my last 20 years of life in science. It will continue, but the future is Asia. And I'd like to uh, announce that as of September, the GNUSI Lab will be moving to ASTAR Singapore, it's the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, to help build their new, newly minted infectious disease laboratories, a center that will focus on emerging infectious diseases. And with that, thank you very much. And I will take some questions if you have them. Fantastic talk, Marco, a real tour de force. Um, amazing. A big announcement at the end, very exciting. All right, any questions? People wanted to just speak up or type in the questions. Oh, we got something here. From Mehdi, maybe I'll read this out to you. You have some lunch there. Uh, do you have enough resolution to study minority variants from publicly available SARS-CoV-2 sequences in order to map its mutagenic trajectory and perhaps predict future variants? Well, that's a good question. So I think, I, I don't, uh, at least the tools that we've developed, um, I don't, I wouldn't risk doing that yet. Um, and I think the answer is ultimately there is not enough um, depth or resolution in a lot of those available sequences for the kind of analyses we do, as well as um, so far for everything that we've done experimentally, the biggest problem is batch effect. And we had to really develop the tools, the bioinformatics behind it to avoid batch effect from one sequence run to another. So imagine the differences of just two different sequences in different countries, so to speak. So I think there's like, I think what, what we, we do everything in depth in extreme depth and that is not applicable right now for what is available. But I think what is available is the amount of uh, samples out there. There is maybe a less deep and broader analysis that is possible. And for that, I think, yes, there are, the tools do exist. Maybe Mark, I just want to push you a little bit about the vision in, in Singapore. I know this is relatively new news, maybe just 24 hours old, but I mean, what do you envision there? You know, what, what, which trajectory do you want to continue on? Which new areas do you want to push on? And well, you know, the, the one, one thing that, that was attractive about the, the A-star position is that essentially they, you know, they want me to continue in doing what I'm doing right now. So it would be, we want to continue work in the five viral families with which we've been working on. Um, and it's the, really the opportunity to help build something local. So Singapore in the past didn't have so much of a need to focus on infectious diseases, um, even though it's in a region that does have them, but they're relatively saved from it, so to speak. Um, but there, there's a, a desire now to, to study in more detail things like vector, vector transmitted disease or other respiratory illnesses. Um, but one part that is, if you see the kind of work we've always done, there's, there is a fundamental re part. We, we do basic research, but it's always with this little, maybe it can be applied 
in some way, but it's like way upstream of actual industrialization. And A star is in, in, in their mission, that's kind of the way that they are promoting how science should be done. It should be basic research, but that has these like upstream, maybe it'll be a vaccine in 10 or 20 years. Maybe that so it's allowing it'll allow my lab to continue fostering this and maybe taking it a little farther into the industrialization process as as I have in the past. We got to, will you hire staff? Someone just. Uh... <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, I, you know, most of my, my lab um, in, in preparing for the transition, I've downscaled and a lot graduated the postdocs and students fortunately haven't destroyed any of their careers. And I have the um, permanent staff will, which will, you know, stay in, in France because they have permanent positions and will begin to look for new students and postdocs and, and staff um, as I make the transition over. So I'll be, I'll be looking for that, yes. I see Veronica said hello. Hi, Veronica, nice to hear from you. And a question from Jack Moen. Uh, you mentioned recoding viruses for the more favorable development of stop codons for vaccines. Have you considered prioritizing low abundance codons to decrease replication of viruses for live attenuated vaccines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you look, there, there's codon rewiring, there's, there's different, um, you, you can kind of come to the same thing from different, different approaches, right? One is like, is, is the, um, the expression levels of proteins that'll be affected. Others is the CPG uh, motifs that might um, induce immunity. And uh, we haven't ever put all those things together. Uh, we focused on just that one, one to stop mutation. Ultimately, one of the great plans or ideas was, can we come up with a real interesting amino acid or codon matrix to kind of give a point system of all these things put together. And then to really rationalize, maybe for a certain given viral gene, you will want more or less of one type of codon rewiring compared to another. That really opens up a whole, you know, a whole series of studies. We're just at the beginning. All right. Some people are saying you're a rock star, Marco. I agree with that. Uh, question from uh, Jennifer. Um, what a fantastic talk. Thank you for your perspective and congratulations on your move. Very exciting. Can you provide your perspective on viruses like coronaviruses that have RDRPs with proofreading capabilities based on your work, some mutation rate is required. How do uh, coronaviruses accomplish this? And uh, oh, thanks to me for sharing this talk with others, including other Canadians. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, yeah, so, well, so for, you know, for, for the coronaviruses, that was the the first work we did with Mark Dennison's team that studied NSP14 and the exonuclease and proofreading activities of it that helped perhaps explain how these things are so much bigger. Also, you know, bringing the question of, well, are the other almost as big RNA viruses, do they have similar uh, proofreading activities? So the coronavirus is certainly, again, even with the exo um, or proofreading activity, they still make mutations. And ultimately, it still comes out to roughly one mutation per genome per round of replication. What, what I found surprising is in the work we did with Mark Dennison, and he showed all this work, it's, it's their stuff. When you remove that, the virus now makes a huge amount of mistakes, or many more, but it's also able to accumulate it. They passage some of these exo and mutants for 30, 40, 100 cycles, and they accumulate like 100 mutations across the genome. Again, it's a big genome, but it suggests that's a lot for an RNA virus because usually RNA viruses, most mutations are lethal. But if it's able to accumulate that many, then it would suggest also that perhaps the genome of coronavirus is also more robust. It's able to tolerate more mutations. That might also explain how Omicron can have all of a sudden, you know, so many more with respect to a strain that was circulating not that much, you know, not that long ago. So I think there's a more there's more space in Corona. Um, ultimately, through its evolution, it's it's managed to have a genome that allows or tolerates more mutation. But these are really interesting topics to to explore further. Another question here, a set of questions from Munya from uh, Carolina Lopez's lab. How much of a role do you think RDRP has in generation and accumulation of DVGs, given that it's tightly linked to replication? Keeping in mind that they're they are found at low viral titer, and then a quick follow up: What role do you think uh, DVGs have in co-infections? Yeah. So the for all the work that we've been doing so far, it, there's a really tight uh, link, a very strong correlation between the mutation rate or the polymerase error rate and the uh, DVG formation. 
So it, it, it's almost like if, if you increase the speed or sloppiness of the polymerase, you're going to increase the number of defective genomes that it makes, at least in terms of the deletions, which seems to be, you know, you can imagine it's a slipping or jumping of the polymerase. The role of DVGs in co-infection, I mean, until for now, so much has focused on the fact that DVGs generally are bad for a virus population when they're present at really high levels. But Caroline, Carolina and I have been talking about uh, over the years that certainly there must be some situation where a certain amount of DVGs might be beneficial to viral population. And there is some of the most recent work that is being done in my lab that is not yet published that started with Veronica and is continuing with uh, PhD student Dean that we have some situations where we do see that the presence of a defective viral genome um, at a cert, at least at a, a below th the threshold of interfering can provide a benefit to the virus population because it serves as a template for recombination to bring extra mutations when the virus population needs it. Okay, very good, excellent. All right, so um, thank you, Marco, um, for flying here to give this seminar. Uh, <laughs> I know you fly back, uh, I guess, tomorrow with, with your pugs. Yes. Um, but um, we're going to go now eat some oysters with you, Marco. So, all right. To reward you for an excellent talk. So, thank you, Marco, and thanks for everybody for listening in. Bye, everyone. See you in Asia.